Hello everyone, and welcome again. So today's lesson will be on polymerization. So essentially the method or the way to produce polymers. That's all polymerization is. It's just combining lots of chemicals to make polymers, which are long chains of chemicals. This is just one industrial version. Um, it kind of just looks like a mess, but um, we use polymers for practically everything um, nowadays. So a polymer is a large chain molecule, and as you see, it's made up of these smaller chemicals. So what happens is we get each of these things called monomers. So mono means one, poly obviously means many. So we take one monomer, which is one one mer, I guess, and then put it into a many mer. Okay, so polymer is many. So you can see each of these monomers gets put into a chain. Like I said, large chain molecule. Puts, put them all together and that forms a polymer. Okay, so that's all a polymer is, just a chain of these monomers. Okay, think, you can even just think of it like a normal chain. Just each link in the chain is a monomer. Okay, so synthetic polymers, as in uh, synthetic polymers are the ones that we create, not the ones that we find in nature. There are polymers in nature, but we're talking about the synthetic ones, the ones we can create. Uh, sometimes called plastics, okay? They don't necessarily have to be plastics. For instance, Teflon, I would kind of not classify as a plastic, but for the most part, most synthetic polymers that we see are for some form of plastic that we're familiar with, okay? So polymer applications, so where do we use polymers? I said that we use them pretty much everywhere now. Where, like where? So. Polymers are, and plastics, if you just think of anything plastic in your life, that has a polymer in it, okay? So that's the first thing where I say it's everywhere, okay? So they have a bunch of applications and plastic is just one of many. So the property of a polymer, as in the way it does certain things, the way it handles certain conditions, determines what we use it for, okay? So different polymers have different properties just like different metals have different properties, okay? For instance, if I have steel, I know steel is very, very strong, but it's not very light, okay? So I would really not want to use steel for, say, an athlete's um, cycle, right? It may be really strong, like for instance, the Tour de France. Um, no one uses steel, steel bicycle frames. Why? Because it's so heavy. Um, and if you're pedaling for like, 20, 30, hundreds of kilometers, you really don't want to be carrying that extra weight. So you can see the property of the steel, even though it's very strong, um, but it's very heavy. So you can see properties can affect how we use them, right? So just like that, a polymer's properties depend on how we use them, okay? So if a polymer is not very strong or not very hard, I won't use it to, for instance, um, encase my laptop in plastic for instance, because my laptop has a lot of plastic in it, I really don't want that plastic to be able to break because I don't want my laptop to break. So you can see that's just how you can use the properties to determine the suitability of that plastic. So the properties of polymers can be controlled, okay? So, and by controlled I mean to a certain extent. We can't just miraculously make plastic as strong as steel. Um, but we can control to a limited degree how much or what the properties of a particular plastic are. So for instance, the same plastic, same monomers, can form very hard, dense plastic, or it can form the same kind of plastic in plastic bags, okay? So we can control that by altering the reaction conditions, okay? Just by um, tweaking the conditions in the reactor, we can actually make different types of plastic. So some of the reaction conditions, like I talked about them, what are they? So one of them is temperature, right? Because temperature is related to the energy of the particles and it sort of how much they can kind of hit each other and turn into different chemicals. So by altering the temperature, we can alter the properties of the chemical. Okay, so temperature is an important one. Pressure. Pressure, again, is similar to energy, or uh, well, it's sort of a measure kind of of energy. So pressure, if we are at high pressure, the particles may be less mobile. Uh, if we're at low pressure, they might be very more, much more mobile. Um, so it could affect how we restructure the atoms 
or the components to get the final polymer. So pressure is important here too. Uh, the presence of a catalyst, or what that catalyst is, um, depends um, on how you look at it. But a catalyst, as we know, speeds up reactions. Um, so the reactions require less energy to complete. So if, we have, if we're in the presence of an atom, a uh, catalyst, sorry, um, the reaction will go faster. Now, why is that important? Well, one, that's good economically, but there's a much, much more important reason for having good catalysts in polymer production. Let's say that you could go, the chemicals could go down two different path pathways. Okay? One pathway, uh, in the absence of catalysts, there's no catalysts anywhere, the, the lowest energy pathway always wins, right? So the one that takes the least energy always dominates. Okay? So that's just how it works. So we've got two pathways. One that makes this kind of shape. Okay, so the molecules form chains and those chains branch out. The other one just forms this, straight lines. Okay? They have advantage, advantages in, in and of themselves, but let's just say that's what we have. This is the low energy pathway, this is the high energy pathway. Okay? So obviously this one dominates if there's no catalyst. But if there is a catalyst, maybe we could reduce the energy consumption of this pathway to so low that it's less than this one. And thus we get this one dominating instead of this one. Okay? So that's why a catalyst is really important because we could actually get different chemicals if we put the catalyst in because it encourages the chemicals to go down different pathways. Okay? And as you get more advanced in chemistry, so when you go to sort of university and graduate level chemistry, you'll learn how to control all of this stuff, but it's kind of beyond the scope of this video. But just to kind of highlight the importance of the catalyst, that's just one example of where a catalyst can be um, sort of make or break, essentially. Um, additives, so additives are another condition that we add. Um, we could add, add, we add additives, we could put additives in for ver various purposes to for instance, titanium dioxide is used to make plastics more UV stable. So to actually make them uh, not break down in sunlight. So that's one additive. There's many others that we could use. Um, so that's just that's an instantaneous way to change the properties of a particular plastic. My plastic at the start was not UV stabilized, so it will break down in UV light. I put some titanium dioxide in. I got a new property. It is now stable in UV sun and UV light. So that's just one clear example of how it works. Okay, natural polymers. We talked about synthetic ones. There are also natural ones. Uh, if you've got like a house plant or something um, that you are on your desk while you're watching this video, um, if you just touch any of that plant, you're touching a natural polymer. Cellulose, the part, the fibrous part of the plant, is a natural polymer. And they come from living organisms, obviously. That's why it's natural. So like I said, cellulose. One, probably the most, I wouldn't say famous, but the most visible one that we can see is cellulose. Um, rubber. So uh, back in the days of World War II, um, Southeast Asia had a lot of rubber tree plants. So the actual rubber, like in your tires and you know, wherever you use rubber, um, is actually from a plant. Um, nowadays, it's all made synthetically, but in the days of World War II, um, we had rubber trees, like the sap of a rubber tree would actually produce rubber. And so that's another natural polymer that we could be using, talking about. Silk. Um, silk is kind of an interesting one because it comes from a silkworm, obviously. Um, as to its actual chemical compound, I actually don't know what the chemical compound of silk, uh, composition of silk is. But again, it's just a chain of polymers um, that come out of a silkworm when it forms its cocoon. Okay, starch um, from your grainy foods. So any grain has a lot of starch. Starch is a natural polymer. And starch is actually a precursor to cellulose. So starch is sort of the small version or, of cellulose. Cellulose is this really huge molecule. Starch is kind of a smaller version of that. 
The synthetic polymers, okay, so we looked at natural polymers, and you can see they come from living organisms, mostly plants, but in the case of silkworms, silk, so uh, mostly plants and animals, right? But synthetic polymers come from fossil fuels, okay? So when we you know, drill into the earth and get petroleum out, uh, crude oil, if you will, we can use that crude oil to make plastics. So some ones that we see are polyethylene, that's like the stuff in your plastic bags, PVC, uh, for you uh, aspiring plumbers, um, PVC is the stuff we make pipes out of, um, Teflon, um, for any cooks in the audience, um, Teflon, Jamie Oliver has these Teflon coated plates, uh, pans, sorry, that um, basically are non-stick. Um, so Teflon is another polymer that we use. So all of these come from fossil fuels. So we dig, get the crude oil out, we can turn them into all of this a variety of um, different chemicals. So the process is conceptually just this, right? Lots of monomers scattered around, and then we just chuck them together, and then in a chain, and that's what, and then the polymer comes out. Okay. So the chemical process by which monomers link together to form a large chain is called polymerization. Okay. So when we put all these monomers into a chain, that's polymerization, in the simplest way possible. Um, so monomers have structural features that change to accommodate the linkage, okay? You may not understand this from this diagram, but we'll get to that in a sec. But basically, the monomers may actually change shape, or some part of them might change, so that they can form the links together, okay? Um, that's, uh, that's a bit more complex, and we'll deal with that in a, short, in a little while, but that's just something to think about. Okay, there are two types of polymers generally, um, addition polymers and condensation polymers. Okay? Addition polymers are pretty much as simple as it sounds. Um, monomer here connects with monomer here, so this one connects with this one, this one connects with this one, and they just add together. Addition. Okay? That's how you think about it. And that's it. Um, addition polymers are typical of fossil fuel derived polymers so they're more likely to be synthetic polymers. Um, you don't see many condensation polymers in synthetic polymers. Okay? So condensation polymers, first, if you want to understand what this is, think about what condensation is. Um, if you don't know, condensation is when the water, the condensation of water, for instance, is when water in gaseous form turns into water in liquid form. Okay, so it condenses. So if, for instance, you're in a humid country, um, that's like humidity is like 100% or something, and you have a really cold drink um, in a glass, water forms on the outside because the cold drink takes all the energy out of the water in the air, and the water sticks to the glass. So water out of air, okay? Think about that. That's condensation. But in the polymerization case, it's very similar. The monomers stick together, right, into a chain, just like this. But instead of just sticking together like the addition case, we out pops some water, okay, or another small molecule, okay. So when they combine together, some water just pops out, or another small molecule pops out. So just like water pops out of the air to condense, water pops out of the monomers to form a condensation polymer, okay? But just remember, it doesn't have to be water, it can be any type, or uh, any very small, it can be some small other molecules, okay? But it's usually water. And this is more um, typical of natural polymers. So if we look at the formation of cellulose, um, we will see that water pops out, okay? So that's just something to think about. Okay, so addition polymerization. So the monomers add up to form a long chain, as I said. And if we look at this diagram, when it's at the top, you can see that it's the ethylene molecule. There's a double bond between each of the Cs and no links between the two separate monomers. Okay? So the ethylene is the monomer. What's in the circle is the monomer. 
Okay? But when it goes down to the bottom, you can see that the double bond disappears and a link forms between monomer on the left and monomer on the right. So what's happened is the electron in the double bond okay, goes this way to the end of the molecule, and this one goes to this way to the end of the molecule, and it forms a bond to the next monomer over. Okay? So each of the ethylene monomers does this, so the one part of the bond breaks up, and then they just stick to each other um, to form this addition polymer. Okay, so that's that's all that's happening. Okay, it's a very very simple process. Condensation polymers are a little bit more complicated, um, but that's just addition. Simple. Double bond breaks up, then each monomer just sticks on to the end. So all atoms in in the monomer incorporate into the new polymer. Okay, so. As you can see here, every part of the monomer is part of the new polymer. Like one of these hydrogens doesn't just go off on its own. It's part of the next part. Okay? In condensation, obviously, some water or some other chemical comes out. So obviously that can't be part of the polymer. And that's why this is a, it's just a statement to show the difference between addition and condensation polymers. Now the monomers, part of what has to happen is the monomers have to be unsaturated which means that um, basically the carbons can't be loaded with the maximum number of hydrogens, right? We need a double bond essentially for this to happen, okay? Because the double bond is quite reactive. So basically what we're saying is we can't just have ethane because the electrons are not mobile enough for addition polymerization and, you know, we can't obviously then incorporate all of the atoms. So basically, as I mentioned, double bonds open to form new linkages um, with other monomers. So double bond breaks up, moves to the sides, and the ethylene polymerizes to form polyethylene. You could call it ethene as well. Um, I'm just a bit old-fashioned and use ethylene. Um, ethene is a, just as acceptable to use. And it forms polyethylene. Again, if you, if you want to use ethene, polyethene. Okay? I think I just like to use polyethylene because it's what I've always used and it kind of rolls off the tongue a bit nicer than polyethene. But to each of their own. Okay, So when you polymerize things, um, the problem is not all of them are going to polymerize to exactly the way you want it. So say we wanted a polyethylene molecule that is 50 monomers long. Okay, So 50 monomers stuck together. Okay, We're not always going to get that because so not everything that comes out of the reaction is going to be the perfect 50 ethylene long polymer. Okay? And that's because of randomness. Molecules are governed a little bit by randomness. Okay? So what happens is we get reaction products that are differing lengths because sometimes they might terminate for some reason, other times it might terminate, uh, it might get longer because it didn't terminate fast enough. So you get like a kind of like a spectrum of possible answers. So the polymer chains produced from 100 monomer units to 100,000 monomer units. So they could be you know, a huge range. Okay? But there is a distribution. Okay? So we can if we control the reaction conditions, we can actually sort of shift this distribution around. And um, for those who are really, really inclined mathematically, this is almost like a probability distribution. So you get the peak here is the average one, the one that comes up kind of the most. And obviously, there are some that are very, very small. That's not very likely. So you see there aren't a lot of them. And then there are some that are very, very, very big, because molecular weight is a measure of how big or small they are. And you see that there are some that are very, very big, but there's not a lot of them. Okay, So we can kind of shift this distribution left and right depending on how we set up the reaction. Okay? So here's the first type of, well here's the first polymer that we're going to look at, which is low density polyethylene. It's sometimes called LDPE, but low density polyethylene is just what it's called. Okay? And it was one of the first polymers to ever be created. So we require a reaction temperature of about 300 degrees Celsius and 3,000 atmospheres of pressure. 
Um, so that's about 30 bar, um, or I guess 3,000 kilopas oh, yeah, kilopascals. So um, just different units for different things, I guess. And we use this kind of organic catalyst. It's a peroxide. So the peroxide is the key part of this catalyst. Um, this other stuff is just sort of for stabilization purposes. And this is the structure of the, ben the benzoyl peroxide catalyst. So the, the benzoyl part is these kind of hexagon rings. And the peroxide is, part, is, the, is related to the oxygen. Okay? And polyethylene, in the low density case, you can see these lines represent possible chains. Okay? So this would be one chain of polyethylene, and this would be like a branched part of it, so another chain sort of spontaneously formed on the end, and then another one here. So you can see that the polyethylene doesn't form very, very straight lines. It forms these like branches, and that's kind of related to it the properties that it has. So again, highly branched polymer. Okay, so you can see it from the diagram. So there are three stages in this polymerization. Um, and basically it's turning this ethylene into this long chain polyethylene. Okay, so the initiation state, um, basically what happens is we start the reaction. The catalyst the peroxide attacks the double bond and then causes it to break up and the two electrons to go to either side of the molecule. Then there's propagation, so the chain starts to connect together and that's what we call propagation. It propagates, it goes, it starts, continues. And then we terminate it, right? Because if each of the monomers keep connecting, there'll be two ends that don't connect, that have still two electrons. So we've got to stick something on there to stop the um, more monomers continuing to just keep adding on to either end. Okay, so we've got to stop them. And that's the termination. Okay, so the initiation part is that the benzyl peroxide catalysts form radicals which um, initiate the reaction. So radicals are just chemicals that have an extra electron that's not bounded and they go and attack things. Okay. So you can see here, uh, R is just a generic way of saying hydrocarbon. So no need to worry about what R is, it's just a hydrocarbon. R prime is just another hydrocarbon. Different one to R, but just a hydrocarbon. So we don't really need to know what they are right now. And so what happens is you can see this OO bit in the middle breaks up, and then each one of them, RO, has a dot, which means it's got a free electron, and R prime O dot also has a free um, electron, and they go and attack. Um, the double bond. Okay, so the the initiator radicals react with the double bond um, in the monomer. So you can see it jumps down, attacks the one electron pops out here to bond with the initiator, and then the other electron goes over to this side. Okay, and the activated monomer radical forms. So this is the activated monomer radical. So this now can go bond to other monomers. So radicals have a single electron and are very reactive. Okay, so that's why we use radicals, because they react really, really frequently. So if you've heard of radicals, you might have heard them in your body, free radicals. Um, free radicals are dangerous, apparently, because they attack your cells. So we use antioxidants to get rid of them. Okay, so the propagation step. So the activated monomers break double bonds in other monomers. So they go and actually attack the double bonds in other monomers. So this guy will go and attack another one of these ethylene molecules and stick to it, okay? And then that will form two monomers plus a radical, and then that will go and attack, and it'll just keep happening. So a new monomer will then bond to the activated chain. So it'll just keep sticking things on until we tell it to stop. And so it just keeps getting longer and longer. Okay, so then um, an activated chain finds another chain of random length, so this is the termination step. You can see this one has one radical on this end, this one has one radical on this end. And when they meet, they bond together. But what you notice is there's no more radicals. Now you can't do anything more because there's no more electrons that are free. So this is the termination step. Nothing left to do. It can't, and so this is your new monomer, a polymer, sorry. 
it's six carbons long plus its initiator. Okay? And that's the final product. Okay? So that's how you terminate it. So the product polymers have a range of lengths, and that's where the randomness comes in, right? So if, for instance, this one on the right-hand side here found another monomer, uh, another, sorry, almost polymer of different length, so maybe it was 20 carbons long, then you would have a 22 carbon long chain. Okay, so you can see just sticking them together doesn't really, uh, it's going to be a random process. It's going to be some kind of randomness associated with it. You're not going to have everything exactly the same, which is something we have to deal with. So once joined, there are no more radicals, so no more chains. Okay, that's it, no more. Okay. So the characteristics of LDPE are that it's highly branched. Um, because it's branched, the, molecule polymer, or the polymer molecules are actually quite far away from each other. They're kept at a distance. And because of that distance, the dispersion forces are quite weak. So the force of attraction between molecules is quite low. Okay, it's got low density, hence its name, low density polyethylene. And a low boiling point. Okay, so it's about 80 degrees. So you can melt plastic bags at about 80 degrees Celsius. Um, and it's very flexible, soft, plastic bags. Think about it. You can manipulate them, open them up, but generally they're pretty okay. They're quite easy to manipulate. Okay, so we can use LDP for heaps of stuff. So garbage bags, as you can see, cling wrap. Um, or these plastic squeeze bottles. Again, because it's flexible, it's malleable. Okay, so um, that's why its properties kind of inform its uses. Okay. Now, the high density polyethylene is a slightly different beast in and of itself. You can see what's the difference. Well, look, no branches. It's basically just straight polymer chains. Okay, and we use what's called a Ziegler-Natta catalyst which is a combination of titanium chloride and triethyl aluminium. Uh, you can look up what these are. It's not really important that you know their chemical compositions. But that's what it is, the ziegler natta catalyst. And the reaction temperature is a fair bit lower. You can see it's 80 to 100 degrees Celsius. The reaction pressure is a lot lower as well, 20 atmospheres. And the reason for that is because high temperatures would cause lots of random motion. Lower temperatures would keep everything kind of um, more ordered. It won't move as much, essentially. And the output is unbranched linear polymer products. So very, very little branching um, and very straight polymer. And because they're straight lines, you can pack the straight lines really closely together, right? You can just stack them on top of each other and form um, very, very closely packed um, polymers. And because you can put them so close together, it's obviously very dense, okay? part of the high density polyethylene part. And it's got a higher melting point than LDPE, which is about 135 degrees. So it's about 55 degrees better, or it takes about 55 degrees more to melt this plastic than it does low density. And because it's so dense and everything's so rigidly placed together, it's very, very hard. Like It's quite a strong plastic. And what we use it for, uh, we use it for like anything where the plastic is quite hard. So plastic crates, rubbish bins, um, and the kind of plastic bags that hold fruit from Woolworths or something like that. Um, so they crackle for other reasons, but that's how you kind of identify them. And even though this is quite flexible, just remember that there's very little plastic in it. So it's not going to be super rigid because you can, there's so little mass in it that it should be able to flex a little bit easier. Okay, So we'll do some questions now, hopefully to uh, kind of summarize what we've learned about plastics and polymerization particularly. So this question is, which of the following is a monomer that could be used to make this polymer? Okay, The polymer is this. Now just a brief word on notation. The n at the bottom just means uh, it could be any integer number. So it could be 1, 2, 3, uh, actually not one, uh -huh. could be two, three, four, et cetera, um, depending on how big you want your polymer. Okay, So it just means this unit times by n number of times, 40 if n is 40, a billion if n is a billion. Okay, So we've got to think, OK, firstly, what can we 
How do we kind of break down this question? Firstly, we remember that monomers have to be unsaturated. Okay? So it means that we can't have all this hydrogen everywhere. So that immediately gets rid of A. Okay? So no A. There's no oxygen really in here. Um, and I don't really see how oxygen fits in here. So it's probably not C. And given that this looks like an addition polymer, we need to combine it with lots of other things. Um, and you can see the base unit has at least two carbons. Okay, so this can't be the case because we've got three carbons. So the base unit has to have at least two, only two carbons, at most two carbons. So it can't be this one. It can't be this one, this one, or this one. So it's got to be B, right? And it looks just like polyethylene, which it is. Okay? So the monomer for polyethylene is ethylene, which is an ethylene has a double bond, which can open, giving the monomer linking capacity. And so it must be B. Okay? So that's how you kind of go and break down each particular one and say, well, which one is correct. So the monomer from which this polymer could be made is <coughs> which of the following? So again, we go through the steps. Okay? Each monomer section of the chain contains a bromide, a bromide ion. So anything with bromide in it, without bromide in it, can't be the case. Okay, none of them. So all of them have bromide, so that doesn't help. The monomer is therefore bromoethene. Okay, so it's if we just look at one unit, so what are the repeating units? Well, if we kind of cut it off here, that's kind of the repeating unit. So again, the repeating unit has only two carbons, so it's probably not this one. Uh, it can't be saturated, so it can't have all of its bonds taken up, so it can't be this one. Um, so it could be either this one or this one. So basically, it only has one bromide for every base monomer unit. So that means that it can't be this one because there's two bromides for every one monomer unit. So it must be D. There you go, D. So that's how you, again, how you approach each question and how you look at a, a polymer. Okay, which of the following correctly describes this graph? Okay, so the graph is sort of a probability distribution of the number of polymer molecules against the molecular weight. So remember the peak is the average molecular weight. So polymer molecules are made quickly at first and then more slowly. Okay, this tells you nothing about the speed, so it can't be A. At any instant during polymerization, the polymer molecules formed very vary in size. Yes, that could be the case. Could be that at any moment lots of the polymers will have different sh sizes. The polymer molecules formed have a curved shape. Again, that tells us nothing about the shape of the molecules. It tells us how big they are. And the polymer molecules formed first are quite long, but they become shorter with time. Again, there's no reference to time in this graph, so it can't be any of that one. So it must be B. At any instant polymerization um, the polymer molecules formed vary in, in size. So here's the explanation. When the monomers link together, they do so in a random fashion. Remember? Um, they're governed by the random kind of Brownian motions. So some product polymer molecules incorporate more monomers than others, which means that they have different sizes. And so there's a distribution of polymer weights. Um, adjusting the reaction conditions can narrow the distribution. So the if we were to change up the kind of the reaction rate or the reaction conditions, we could sort of shrink or expand um, this distribution. So your answer is B. Okay. So compare the process of polymerization with catalytic cracking. That sounds fairly easy. Okay. So catalytic cracking is the process by which large alkane chains um, are broken down into smaller alkane chains and alkenes. Okay, so we took this big alkane chain and cut it into smaller alkane or alkene parts. Polymerization is the opposite of that. We take small monomer units, which are like alkene type groups, and connect them together to form large, almost saturated polymer chain groups. Okay, so that's the difference. 
One takes a big thing, cuts it into smaller pieces. Polymerization takes a small monomer and sticks them all together to form a big chain. Okay. Provide uses of LDPE and HDPE and relate their uses to their properties. Okay. So the uses of LDPE are things like garbage bags, flexible film wrap, so like cling wrap, um, pl plastic squeeze bottles, electrical insulation, anything where malleability is key. And yeah, basically, malleability is the key point. Softness is important also. Um, so the properties are that it's highly branched in its structure. So that gives it its flexibility because the forces holding each molecule are not very strong. So that's because the branches prevent the formation of orderly structures. They don't just line up perfectly next to each other. They actually spread out um, and kind of don't stick too close together. Um, and that remain that gives it the soft and flexible characteristics um, and the ability to mold it very easily because the forces holding the molecules where they are is quite weak because they're so far away. So with HDP, you've got plastic crates, rubbish bins, petrol tanks, um, glove boxes, anything a lot of car applications, but anything with where you need rigid um, plastic, strong plastic, okay? And the reason is because with the molecules are all linear. They're all straight lines. Okay? So they all line up perfectly next to each other, which means you can stick them really close together. And because you can stick them close together, they hold each other very strongly together. So because all of them are emitting or are like attracting each other with these dispersion forces, which gives an almost crystalline appearance or uh, structure and makes it very, very rigid. So that's why these rigid structures all come from the fact that the polymer chains line up perfectly next to each other, which means they can hold each other together very strongly. Okay. So that concludes today's lesson on polymerization. We looked at what polymerization is and, a sm and some applications of some um, typical polymers in industry. So hopefully you can understand what polymerization is. Um, and so in future lessons, we'll look at other polymers and also um, uh, what uh, those other polymers can do. So I hope you've enjoyed this lesson, and thank you for watching.